dying. God expects us to be people of action, and action is a way that we demonstrate our faith. But it turns out that procrastination is often a way for us to avoid doing what needs to be done. It amazes me all the incredibly creative things that people come up with to try to impact the world and society without having to go out and preach the gospel. You see, avoiding what needs to be done can be quite a time-consuming thing in and of itself. Fulfilling God's will for our lives is always going to require putting off compromise, procrastination, and laziness. It's always going to require taking critical action, and that means it's going to require diligence, discipline, risk, and good old-fashioned hard work. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. We're glad that you're here with us live in the studio. And also to those of you that are watching this by way of video, maybe you're in a small group, maybe you're in a home group, I want to say welcome to another episode of Live Before You Die, based on my book by the same name. My name is Daniel Colenda, and we are now in part two of this series, which is about the discovering and fulfilling of God's will for our lives. Now, today we're going to be tackling a very serious and important issue. We're going to discuss one of the most dangerous enemies of God's will for your life, the poison of unbelief. And I'm going to try to help you not only to be aware of it in your life, but also to overcome it as well. And this is a subject that is of particular interest when we're talking about God's will for our lives, because this is so vital if you really want to be able to step into the fullness of what God has for your life. But it's also important in a much more general sense as well. And so whether you've been serving the Lord for 50 years and you're a veteran Christian, or maybe you're still not even a believer, this is for you today, and it just might be one of the most important messages you've ever heard. In fact, if you're not a believer, I can tell you that God's top priority for your life is that you would come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and put your trust in Him. And so I'm going to try to approach this subject today like a funnel. We're going to start with some really broad brush principles, and then we're going to tighten the emphasis down until we zero in on God's will for your life like a laser beam. But first, I want for us to begin, as we usually do, by praying together for God's help. So would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, I present myself to you today as a living sacrifice. Because you gave your son for me, I give myself to you fully. This is my reasonable service. I lay my dreams and desires at your feet and ask that your will would be done in my life. Use my mortal hands to build your eternal kingdom. Use my life to propel your purpose forward. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, let me start like this. I want to start with a little survey. How many of you would consider yourselves to be very rational thinkers? Okay, there's a few of you. That's encouraging. <laughs> How many of you would say that, on the contrary, you are completely irrational, completely illogical, and biased in the way that you make judgments? Okay, so the rest of you are somewhere in between. Okay. All right, now, don't be shy about this one. How many of you would say that you're smarter than the average person, or you think you are? Okay, let me see those hands. Don't be shy. If you're smart, be proud of that. Okay, so that was about 50%, and that's a very predictable response. Actually, according to a survey by YouGov.com, about 55% of Americans believe that they're smarter than the average American. Or as uh, YouGov puts it, the average American thinks that he or she is smarter than the average American. <laughs> so... Now, today, we're going to be discussing the danger of unbelief as it pertains to the will of God. And more than that, we're going to talk about how to get rid of it. But what I would like to do first is start out by taking the complete opposite approach. 
And as strange as this might seem, I want to encourage you to be a little bit more skeptical, not less. Now, I'm not talking about being more skeptical of God or of the Bible. People seem to have that figured out pretty well. But I'm going to ask you to be a little bit more skeptical of yourself. Because the thing is, we all have this tendency to trust that our perceptions, our opinions, and our powers of reason are correct. But the truth is that humans are actually extremely prone uh, to horrendous errors in their reasoning. They're notorious for this, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a moment. Now, if you're saying to yourself, exactly, I agree with you, most people are morons. Well, <laughs> that's also a very predictable response. This is what is known as blind spot bias, which is the tendency to quickly recognize errors in somebody else's logic while at the same time remaining utterly oblivious to our own. And it's important to remember this. You don't know what you don't know. You can't see your blind spots. That's why they're called blind spots. In fact, I want for us all to just do a little experiment together, okay? I want you to close one eye, and I want you to look straight ahead and take your thumb and put it out ahead of you. And now very slowly, I want you to, very slowly, okay, I want you to move your thumb across your field of vision, keep looking straight ahead, and you're going to notice that at some point something interesting happens. Your thumb disappears. How many of you see that? Did you notice that? Did you realize that you had that blind spot? Do you realize that the whole day, every day of your life, you're going through life with that blind spot, and you never do see what's there, but your brain compensates and makes something up and fills in that spot, and you think you know what you're seeing, but you actually don't, and you never have, and you just discovered it right now. We all have these blind spots, and the reason they're blind spots is because we're not aware of them. I want you to remember that. But now let's just say, for the sake of this discussion, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that you actually are smarter than the average person. Well, here's the bad news. That does not necessarily make you any less prone uh, to errors from blind spot bias. In fact, it might even make you more prone to these errors. There was a study led by Richard West and Keith Stanovich which was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, that suggests something very counterintuitive. The study said that smarter people may actually be more prone to certain errors in their thinking, and especially to blind spot bias. This is what the abstract of the study said. We found that none of these biased blind spots were attenuated by measures of cognitive sophistication, such as cognitive ability or thinking dispositions related to bias. If anything, a larger blind spot bias was associated with those with a higher cognitive ability. Let me give you the translation of that. Smarter people were more prone to this bias, not less. But blind spot bias is not our only problem. We're also affected by things like choice supportive bias, which is the tendency to evaluate past decisions more favorably than we should. There is confirmation bias, the tendency to interpret information in a way that supports our preconceived beliefs. There is expectation bias, which is the tendency for experimenters to highlight data that agrees with their expectations for the outcome of an experiment and downplay data that disagrees with their expectations. There is framing effect, which is when people draw different conclusions from the exact same set of facts when they're presented a little bit differently. And the list goes on and on. There's gambler's fallacy, hindsight bias, illusions of control, validity, and correlation, information bias, negativity bias, outcome bias, and still the list goes on. In fact, as I was preparing for this lesson, I counted nearly 170 such cognitive biases that are confirmed and, and studied, and I'm sure that there are actually many more. What you need to realize is that all or most of these cognitive glitches affect all of us at some point or another, and the result is that they negatively impact our ability to think rationally and to make sound judgments and to behave and believe correctly. And all of this is compounded by the fact that human beings are notoriously more optimistic than realistic. In fact, this is another one of those biases that's been confirmed in many studies. It's called optimism bias. The positive side of optimism bias is that we ha have been, as one article put it, we seem to have been hardwired for hope. And this can be a great thing when you're in a very negative situation, maybe your odds of survival as a, as a creature are very unlikely. Human beings have this great ability to still have hope and to still be positive, and that can be a wonderful advantage. But on the other hand, we also seem to think a lot more of ourselves than we ought to. In fact, you, think, you remember that study that I cited earlier 
uh, by West and Stanovich where it found that intelligent people have a greater propensity for blind spot bias. Remember that? I think my theory is that one of the reasons that these people have a greater propensity for blind spot bias is pre precisely because they are smart. And as smart people, they tend to think of themselves more highly than they ought to. And my friend, there is a very non-technical, old-fashioned term for this. It's called pride. And pride, as the Bible teaches, goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. And pride itself, I want you to understand this, pride is a completely irrational delusion. Even the greatest, most powerful, most gifted, most intelligent human being in the world is actually the equivalent of a subatomic particle in the cosmos. Pride is a laughable delusion. I want you to think about it this way. Imagine that you are in an airplane and you look out of the window of that airplane at 30,000 feet on a clear day. What you will discover is that human beings would not even be visible from that altitude. In fact, I would say that even the largest, most imposing man-made structures on Earth would be hard to see from that altitude. And while 30,000 feet may seem like a great distance, relative to the size of the universe, it's actually still incredibly close, only a little more than five and a half miles away. Now, think about this. If you look up at the stars on a clear night, it's mind-blowing to think that the closest one after the sun is 25 trillion miles away from Earth. And while that sounds like a vast distance, and it is, it's completely impossible for our finite brains to comprehend such a distance. Actually, it's still relatively quite close. It's only a little bit more than four and a half light years away. Now, let me just stop here and remind you of what a light year is. I know for some of us, it's been a long time since our high school physics class. I want you to remember that a light year is not actually a measurement of time like you might seem to think from the name. It's a measurement of distance. A light year is the distance that you could cover if you could travel at the speed of light nonstop for one solid year. So light travels 186,000 miles per second. Not 186,000 miles per hour, 186,000 miles per second. How many would say that is fast? Now, to put that into perspective, the fastest recorded speed for an aircraft that I could find was from a rocket that traveled at about 4,500 miles per hour. So that's a little bit over one mile per second. And that's amazing, right? Can you imagine flying at one mile per second? But light travels 186,000 miles per second. So that's 186,000 times faster than any aircraft that's ever flown. And still, if you could get in an interstellar vehicle and travel 186,000 miles per second, nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it would still take you four years to reach the closest star. That's what it means to say that the closest star after the sun is four light years away. Now, there are other stars in our galaxy that are known to be more than 80,000 light years away. And there could be as many as 400 billion of them just within our own little galaxy. But that's not even the most amazing part because there are more than 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. I didn't say 100 billion stars. I said 100 billion galaxies. Remember, you can travel 80,000 light years just in our galaxy, and ours is one of the smaller galaxies. But I'm talking about now more than 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe that spans tens of billions of light years. Are you beginning to get this? It's hard to even articulate it. Are you beginning to comprehend how utterly minuscule we are? When you looked out of a, the window of an airplane at 30,000 feet, human beings were so small at that height they were invisible, and now we're talking about billions of light years. In the context of the universe, the Earth itself is less than an infinitesimally microscopic speck of dust. And we are the Earth's microbes, and that's probably a generous description. <laughs> now, as utterly overwhelming as all of this is that I'm describing, everything that I've just described, stars, planets, solar systems, galaxies, all of this immensity, as vast as it is, actually makes up only 4% of the universe. The other 96% of the universe is what is known as dark energy and dark matter, which are considered unknowable. So Richard Panic um, wrote a book called The 4% Universe. 
and he did an interview with space.com where this is what he said, the majority, overwhelming majority of the universe is, who knows? It's unknown now and possibly forever. That's pretty humbling, isn't it? But let's be honest about this because even to say that 4% of the universe is knowable is a colossal exaggeration because what you have to remember is that most of what is included in that number is completely out of reach. So for example, the billions upon billions of stars and planets in the cosmos that are observable and physical, in that sense they are observable, they are completely out of reach. They'll never be anything more to us than electromagnetic radiation and computer simulations. So for example, the Andromeda galaxy, which is our neighboring galaxy, is technically knowable in the sense that it's physical. So that means if you could get there and you could observe it and touch it and examine it, it's technically knowable, but it's two and a half million light years away. We'll never get anywhere near it. And that's the closest of hundreds of billions of galaxies that contain more stars than all of the grains of sand on the world's beaches. I mean, you have to realize that the vast overwhelming majority of that 4% of the knowable, knowable universe is for all practical purposes an endless ocean that we will only ever dip our toe into. We have about as much capacity to understand the universe as a gnat has trying to drink the ocean. So, of that 4% of the universe that is observable, the question is how much do we actually know? Now, I doubt that anyone would dare to speculate, and probably any estimation would be far too generous, but what's easier is taking inventory of what we are certain we don't know. This puts things into perspective very quickly. Caleb Scharf is the director of Columbia University's Multidisciplinary Astrobiology Center. He pointed out that with all of the knowledge we have acquired, nothing compares to the perspective, the shock, or the excitement of being reminded of what we don't know. And in his article in the Scientific American called This is What We Don't Know About the Universe, he gives a small partial list of areas where our scientific understanding is still very pitiful. He says we don't know why the universe exists. Now remember, this is coming from the perspective of a secular scientist. This is not a Christian perspective. We don't know whether life exists anywhere else in the universe. We probably haven't really figured out the quantum world. We don't fully understand our own biology. We don't know how the earth works. We can't prove or solve many of our own mathematical conjectures and problems. And let me add a few of my own to that list. More than 95% of the oceans right here on earth have yet to be explored. We haven't discovered a cure for cancer or AIDS or even the common cold. We have never even been to the core of our own planet. And the list could go on and on and on. And so in the words of Dr. Scharf, for an allegedly clever species on a small rocky planet, this is a bit of an epic fail. <laughs> and so even within that tiny smidgen of the observable universe that is physical and perfectly within reach, I'm talking about stuff right here on our little planet, we are still incredibly ignorant. And this is saying nothing of the intangible and invisible aspects of the natural world. Now, I'm not talking about the supernatural yet. I'm talking about the natural world and things we don't understand. Things like consciousness, things like the origin of life, things like how memories are stored and accessed. About how about where dreams come from? How about where we even got the ability to think abstractly? And then, even more mysterious, are metaphysical, supernatural, and spiritual reality, realities that science has literally no access to. And this is actually a bigger problem than you might realize because, you know, Stephen Jay Gould famously said that science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria. Now, I think I agree with about one half of that statement because on the one hand, I don't think it's correct to say that religion has nothing to say about science. But it is definitely true that purely objective, observable, tested science has very little, if anything, to say about religion. And so science alone has a very small domain. Remember, we have literally no access to 96% of the natural world and very little understanding of the other 4%. So if our powers of observation are so limited in the natural realm, how can they begin to understand anything more transcendent? And yet, modern science has embraced naturalism, which goes beyond science. It's a philosophy. It makes metaphysical claims. Naturalism essentially writes off any possibility of the existence of God or of anything supernatural. But there are two huge problems with this. Number one, science has no authority to comment on spiritual realities. If it's supernatural, science has no comment because it's not natural. 
Does it make sense? But number two, without even realizing it, the naturalist has undermined his own philosophy. Because as the distinguished philosopher Alvin Plantinga argued, if there is no God, and if we came about through a process of unguided natural selection, then there is actually no reason to assume that our senses evolved to perceive objective truth anyway. The, the only thing we know is that our senses evolved to help us survive. In other words, if God did not create our minds, then they probably are not capable of perceiving objective truth anyway. I recently sat down with the distinguished philosopher William Lane Craig, and I asked him to help us understand this evolutionary argument against naturalism. Let's watch this. Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism is really quite simple to understand. It goes like this. According to the theory of evolution, our uh, faculties are selected by natural selection for their survival value. It's the survival of the fittest. So our cognitive faculties are not selected by natural selection on the basis of how well they arrive at truth. They're selected by natural selection simply on the basis of how well they help us survive. And what Plantinga points out is that your beliefs don't need to be true in order for you to survive. You could have all kinds of false beliefs, but they would have survival value. So what that means is that if evolutionary theory is true, we cannot trust our own cognitive faculties to get at the truth because they're not selected for getting at the truth. They're selected on the basis of how well they help us survive. Now, if that's the case, then we can't trust our cognitive faculties. That We cannot trust that they're reliable in getting to truth. But if that's the case, then naturalism is self-defeating because the belief in naturalism has been arrived at precisely on the basis of those unreliable cognitive faculties. The naturalist would have a built-in defeater of his worldview. If he's right, he cannot believe his own worldview because it's formed on the basis of faculties which are aimed at survival, not truth. Now this doesn't show that naturalism is false. Plantinga makes that very clear. But it does show that it's unaffirmable. You cannot rationally affirm naturalism because if you affirm it, you immediately also deny it because you deny that your cognitive faculties are reliable. How do, how do the naturalists respond to this? Well, typically the responses I've seen are based on misunderstandings. They'll say things like this. Well, the best way for my faculties to help me survive is for them to produce true beliefs. If they produce true beliefs, those are the ones that will help me to survive. So even though they're aimed at survival, they'll, they'll give you truth as well because it's by getting you true beliefs that you'll best survive. But planning a shows very clearly, I think, and convincingly that that's just not the case. It's, it's really easy to show uh, how you can have survival value for your beliefs without truth, as long as they produce the right behavior in an organism. That's all that counts. It's a very powerful argument, yeah. one that Darwin himself anticipated and dreaded. Darwin himself said that he was troubled by the fact that he arrived at his theory using, in essence, a brain that has just evolved from monkeys. And how could you trust such a brain to arrive at a correct theory of the, the world. And so at the very least, again, it would suggest that the naturalist ought to exercise a little bit of humility. Well, I should say so. I mean, if your worldview is rationally unaffirmable, that's what he's usually said about the theist, that the theist is irrational. It turns out it's really the naturalist. So Plantinga says, is there a conflict between science and religion? He says, yes. 
there's an enormous conflict between science and the religion of naturalism. So I really could go on and on building this case that we as humans are actually quite ignorant, but I think you get the point. And besides, this episode is actually about getting rid of unbelief. So maybe you would wonder why I would start by causing you to question everything. Well, the reason is we often take great pride in our technological inventions and our scientific advances. We scoff at our ancestors' ignorance and superstition, and we find comfort in the vast knowledge that we have acquired. But I hope that you're able to see that this perspective is really just an illusion. In the grand scheme of things, we are still cavemen, clinging to an understanding of the universe that is almost <laughs> certainly incorrect and undoubtedly incomplete. The truth is you probably are a lot less intelligent and a, and a lot more biased than you realize. We probably have a lot more confidence than we should in our ability to make sound judgments about reality. And that doesn't mean that all of our efforts to think rationally are in vain. But it's helpful to be aware that these weaknesses exist. And not because being aware of our weakness will help us overcome it. Because as Weston Stanovich noted, people that were aware of their own biases were not better able to overcome them. Isn't that amazing? Even knowing we have the biases, we still have the biases. And so, no, being aware of them will not cure our faulty thinking or protect us from bias. So maybe you say, well, what good is it to be aware of them anyway? Well, I would hope that being aware of our limitations would infuse us with a healthy dose of humility. And that humility is so important when we approach the things of God. Next time on Live Before You Die. Now, maybe you're not a scientist or a scholar, but I would hope that we have at least enough intelligence to come to one conclusion. We don't know very much as individuals, and we actually don't know very much as a species either. And this means that we are all trusting to some extent that our perceptions, our premises, and our powers of reason are correct. And that, my friend, is a belief, not a fact. So whatever you believe in and hold on to, it is on some level faith. Faith is not a substitute for reason. Faith is in a totally different category. Biblical faith is better defined as trust. If you are going to follow the call of God on your life, your journey is going to be, not might be, it will be punctuated by defining moments of faith where you are gonna be forced to make a decision to lean on God with radical trust and obedience if you wanna move forward.